All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 28th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2022. How many more years left in this age? I don't know. Not too many. Not too many. There can't be too many left because, well, there wouldn't be much left when the Lord came if you waited too long. Now, and even um, we're running into the limits of our resources. That, that is true. That is true. We, we are consuming. Uh, we're, we're using borrowed energy to live on. We are not. Uh, it's not sustainable. Uh, the human population, it's simply not sustainable anyway because the human population keeps increasing and the planet doesn't get any bigger or more fertile. It would take it would take a large modification, which Christ is capable of doing. But yes, it's just getting more wicked, which means it's less sustainable. Wicked the the level of wickedness that's that's on this world today. Uh 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 uh. This cannot go on much longer. We have gone beyond Sodom and Gomorrah. There is a title for a video, beyond Sodom and Gomorrah, but that won't be this video. Do uh, you know I have an awful lot of trouble finding a church, and you know I I try to you know okay, compromise to to uh, just ignore some things. But if it's not about Jesus Christ, why bother going there? And that is something churches have definitely deteriorated, all of them, all of them. Um, you look at the big box churches now. What 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 are they worshiping other than themselves, or their great leader that stands in front? You know, people like Stephen Furtick, this Church of Stephen Furtick, the Church of Joel Osteen, the Church of Andy Stanley, the Church of John MacArthur. It's all personality cults. I mean, what would happen? Say 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 MacArthur dies or retires. Well, what's going to happen to Grace Community Church? It's going to fragment. I mean, he's the reason people go there. It's like Joel Osteen. Why do? How does he fill an arena? He tells people what they want to hear. Yeah, but without Joel Osteen, you couldn't have filled that arena. This the city there of Houston couldn't even fill it with basketball fans. So. I think they built something else. But yeah, it was a sports arena. Uh, and sh he was, uh, his father had a fairly large church. He was sort of a Pentecostal Baptist, uh, John Osteen. But he actually had some gospel. So how come his son, who is devoid of Jesus and the gospel, can f has much, much, much larger church than his father did? Perhaps the largest church in America. I think it is the largest church in America. How? How? Because he doesn't preach Christ. That's why. You've got to get rid of Jesus because Jesus offends people. That's what Rick Warren did. He basically got rid of Jesus, substituted everything but Christ. And, I, you know, I just put a video up the other day on some easy ways to spot heresy. Uh, basically, if the message... Consistently, I want to make sure this is, I say, make this consistently. It's not Jesus. It's not 
it's a heresy. It's it's something else. A heresy doesn't have to be, you know, an outright denial. It's just a removal of. You know, if you just displace Christ, it's like most traditional Catholic churches. You go in them, and there's always Christ on a cross with some candles. But it is almost never in the center behind the altar. No, no, the big image is Mary, typically. There are exceptions, but typically that's it especially the older ones, it's Mary. Uh, and that's, uh, Jesus is displaced for most Catholics. Uh, Jesus, you know, he's somebody to avoid. You, you don't go to Jesus because he's the coming judge. You go to Mary because Jesus can't possibly deny his mother anything. So you, you, you get Mary on your side and then Jesus will give you what you're looking for. That's the way it is. Been that way for a long time. Going way back to the beginning of uh, the adoration of Mary. Yeah, because that's what the people wanted. It was by popular demand. Just like the doctrine of the, the Marian doctrines of the 20th century. Popular demand. That's what the people wanted. They, they also, there's been a, a persistent movement in Roman Catholicism to, to have Mary declared co-redemptrix with Christ, to make her, her equal with Jesus in our salvation. No, she has no role in our salvation other than, than bearing the Savior. That's her role, period. And that's finished, done. Jesus became flesh. That was her role carrying him. I really don't like the expression mother of God because mother has certain connotations. Uh, no, God does not have a mother. Mother of the body of God, you could say that, or mother of the Lord Jesus, those would be acceptable. Mother of Christ, that would be acceptable. But mother of God is not acceptable. Actually, the word uh, in Greek is theotokos, a God-bearer, carrier. That, that, you know, if you interpret it right, it's okay. But mother of God just doesn't sound right. No. Because your mother, you know, you're... No, she's not the source of his deity at all. His, his flesh, yes, mother of the flesh of our Lord Jesus. Okay, but that, that's just... Uh, rabbit trail there but I was uh, the the displacement no it wasn't a rabbit trail displacement of Christ from the center that's that's a sign of of uh, something that's not right seriously not right churches we gather in the name of the Lord Jesus it doesn't mean that you put that in a sign in front it means that you gather for the purpose of gathering as his church and that's a real problem and I'll get into that in a second. But first of all, I want to go back in my history a little bit. I was I came to the Lord uh, during the period of time that was called the Jesus Revolution or the Jesus Movement or whatever. I wasn't. It, it was. It happened spontaneously because of the Holy Spirit. God was doing this among young people, and from my recollection, almost all the young people, uh, a lot of them came out of the drug culture and college campuses and various places, but it was diverse. You know, there was hippies, but they were diverse. They were the uh, the, the beach bums out in California at, at uh, Chuck Smith's church out there. Uh, you know, and some of those people weren't actually saved. They were, they, they, they were excited about things. They were excited about Jesus. But they didn't seem to actually, they didn't stick. They were like this, well, the parable of seeds. And I was sort of thinking, what happened to us? Well, what happened was we grew up, got married, had children, did normal things. But we're still here, some of us at least, we're still here. 
and it was uh, absolutely transformational. I was born again, you know, while well, I was in the military, but it was in that time frame. And there was a lot of people there with me in the military, young people, that the same thing had happened to. I mean, we were, not that we came from the same backgrounds particularly, but we were all, all had come to be transformed by Jesus Christ, come to know him in reality. Uh, and most of the, of the young people that were part of that had come from church backgrounds. And most of us, I think, were looking for something else. The whole hippie movement uh, basically came out of people from those backgrounds, too, looking for reality. We were looking, in some ways, we were looking for God. I can remember I was often looking for God. I just look at, looked in the wrong places. I was, we went, you know, I was raised going to church. I was confirmed, you know, baptized, confirmed. And, but I, I, did, I stopped going to church as soon as I could, basically, because why? It was dead. There, God wasn't there. God wasn't there, at least from my perception. It's like, you know, they talk about God, but where is he? They could have put a sign in front of almost every one of these buildings that said, the same as it was in, in uh, Athens, to the unknown God built to the unknown God, because that's true of most people that attend them, then and now. It was traditional religion. I was a, raised as a traditional Lutheran. But that's what I was. I wasn't a Christian. I was a Lutheran. And that was true of, I think, most of us. We, we, were, we were looking for more than we saw on Sunday mornings. We were looking for God. In a way, we didn't know what God was, but we were looking for a reality that we didn't see in church. I think that was true. There was we. I didn't see the reality there. I heard a bunch of garbage. It was a originally a moderate Lutheran denomination going liberal. That was their direction. That's the way direction always goes, toward the world. In every denomination, it always heads that way. That's why you keep getting more and more denominations, because you had to start new ones, because the old ones have gone off the edge. The quest for reality. And there was a, generally, if I recall right, there was a fairly negative attitude toward ordinary churches established religion among us and it does persist to this day with me but not because I have an inherent hostility it's just I'm always disappointed and you go to you go to a church that's supposed to be conservative you think is godly and then you find out they deny the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ they have no gospel not everybody there denies that I didn't have the opportunity to take a poll but uh, I do know when I was preaching on Christ and what he did for us on the cross one time, I had a lot of people out there with, with sort of funny looks on their faces, like, what is this? That's a bad sign. I, I just, I was, at, I remember when I was preaching, I was, I was thinking, uh, you know, sometimes when I'm preaching, I'm almost like beside myself. But I'm, I was sort of looking at the faces and like, what's going on? Am I saying something terrible? I was preaching the promises of the new covenant, what what Christ purchased for us on the cross, and it was like these these quizzical looks on their faces, and their, their faces were sort of twisted up, and, and there was a couple of people out there, yeah, 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 and then the rest of them were like looking at me strange. Why? They should have, I shouldn't have been saying anything they hadn't heard before. Turns out, Christ was a missing commodity there. Christ and, his, and Christ crucified was, you know, uh, there was not front and center. Absolutely not. And that's why I was, it took me a year. I was like, what is, you know, something's not right. 
I'm not. I'm. I'm. Every time I went and listened, I would grumble. I'd be making grumbling noise. <laughs> During, I couldn't help myself. It's uh, involuntary. I was shaking my head. You know, this is no, no, no. What is he doing? And then on the way home, you know, it's like uh, I start. And my life, my wife, one of the times said, "Well, what did you say wrong this time?" And then I go, <laughs> "She knew. She knew I was uncomfortable." And I, I am picky. I am picky, but if Christ isn't there, I mean, if if Christ is there at center, I can look overlook a lot of things. But otherwise, I'm I guess I'm sort of looking. Why is this not right? Looking for defects. I'm the, the, my engineer troubleshooter comes out. Okay, so let's go to the scripture, John chapter one. John chapter one is so good. It's like Romans chapter one. Seems I always go back to it. So let's go to uh, John chapter 1, and I'll use the good old King James here, because that's what it was set to search on. I often have to search on that, because otherwise I can't find what I'm looking for. Speaking of Jesus here, he was, or the Word of God, he was in the world, and the world was made by him. The word here is world is cosmos, by the way. I was talking about creation. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came on to his own, to the Jews, to his own people, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave, uh, gave he power, authority, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, John chapter 3, Born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Born of God. Born again. Born of the Spirit is born of God. The new creation is born of God. And the Word was made flesh. The, the, the Word in verse 1. Christ. The word of God became flesh, Jesus, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Question, question. If Jesus were to walk into a church in America today, or a church anywhere, and take a seat in the back, would anybody notice that their Savior was there? Would they? Would they? I mean, if he didn't came, come up in a, the appearance of glory. If he came like he did in Judea, into a synagogue, And if he was given the opportunity to speak like they did out of tradition in the synagogue, and he began to teach, would we do the same thing they did to him? March him off the, uh, off the church and attempt to throw him over the edge of the cliff? In, in Nazareth, his hometown. He came to his own, and his own received him not. The Samaritans often received him, but the Jews seldom did. The majority, some did, but as many as received him. To them he gave the authority to become the sons of God, the children of God. So, here's an interesting test. If you're going to a church... Ask yourself, what would they, what would their reaction be to Jesus? What would happen if Jesus entered the church and asked, "What could I be a member here?" In in what's supposed to be his church? Could Jesus be a member in the church you attend? Well, let's consider that. Let's start with a really easy case. 
the Church of the Nazarene, which which I never knew I never could actually join it. Why? Because they have these things. Uh, they have a, a new one that's every apparently every four years they publish one. But uh, it, it is the manual. This is their Bible. I mean, you, you have to agree with what's in this book to become a Nazarene, including the special rules like do not drink, do not do this, do not do that, all kinds of things you're not supposed to do. Uh, laid out there. Now, they're not the only one that does things like that, by the way. Many Baptist churches have it written into their confession. <laughs> oh, the, the uh, Faith and Me uh, Baptist message, uh, the current one of the Southern Baptists, which isn't necessarily the one used by local churches, uh, require has all kinds of statements on abortion and... and um, education, how education is a good thing. We, and you have to agree with that. You have to agree with all the stuff, all the baggage. All it's, it's like a bill in the Congress. All the things they add on. All the things that are irrelevant they add on. You have to agree with that. You have to vote for that, too. You have to accept that. All kinds of social statements and everything else that are utterly foreign to the Bible. No, you got to accept that, like this. That, that's just, just so obvious in there. I mean, th that's how, you have to have, of course, this, this is, has their, you know, all their rules and the Constitution and everything else, and it is a hier hierarchical denomination. Um, but you've got all kinds of stuff in here. Auxiliary constitutions, how to do this, everything is laid out in here. And you have to agree with it. You have to you have to vow uh, to to some of the stuff in here, like not drinking, <laughs> not going to movies, things like that. Um, they've changed the language a little bit, but it's still the same thing. So could Jesus, the guy that turned, I think it was a hundred, is either eighty or one hundred and twenty gallons of water into wine, and it wasn't grape juice; it was wine. It was wine. Uh, it was alcoholic wine. Would the Nazarenes accept him as a member? No, absolutely not. If Jesus can't become a member of your church, how would it be his church? Consider that. Well, here's another one. Westminster Catechism, uh, a Confession of Faith and Catechisms, okay, with proof texts. You know, this is that, the, the notorious, uh, the Westminster Confession, it's not terrible except in some places. Okay, where it talks about, uh, you know, the, the eternal decree of absolutely everything. Uh, and some other things. Do you, do you think Jesus, see, if you have to agree with this, to be a member in a church? Could Jesus agree with this? Is this his word? No, it's not. It's man's opinion. It's man's opinion, man's speculation. And then they're, they're enforced on you. It's sort of like the Congress. They pass laws, but they're not God's laws. They're not truth. They're generally not even good but they're imposed on you. Do, you. do you think Jesus Christ would agree with, with this book? The, the Lord of the church would say, yeah, yeah, you can, you can put your rules on me too. There's nothing wrong with them. Your rules, man's rules. Could he be a, become a member of a PCA church? Or there's others stricter than that. Or what about the Lutherans? I did. I pulled my... I had this in the house. This is the Book of Concord. In other words, the Book of Agreement that all Lutherans are supposed to agree. Now, even the liberal, I think the, even the ELCA recognizes this, but they don't pay attention to it at all. They just ignore it uh, because they have to ignore it. Anyway, this this is... 
This is a political document, or this is a whole collection of documents, but they, most of them were political. Uh, totally irrelevant to us today. But it has the Augsburg Confession, it has Luther's catechisms and other things in there. And you have to agree. To be a member in, say, uh, Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, you have to agree with this and more. Uh, I'll get that to in a second. What, could Jesus, you know, uh, like uh, exactly Luther's understanding of uh, communion and how Jesus becomes the bread, but not really becomes the bread? I mean, Luther didn't understand it, but he's willing to argue to the death with uh, Zwingli over it. And Lutherans and Calvinists can't sit at the same table because they don't have... See, uh, I could not become a member at a Luther Church Missouri Senate, for example, because I would have to agree with the understanding of communion that's in this book, not the understanding of communion that's in this book. I just think they're wrong. I don't think it, it comes from Roman Catholicism. Over a period of, of 1,500 years, wasn't originally part of Catholicism, but became part of Catholicism. It wasn't uh, made into a dogma until about 1,000 years after the time of Christ. So prior to the Pope decreeing that, you could hold different views and be a good Catholic. But after the Pope rules and decrees something, no. Suddenly it becomes truth. Out of nothing. Creation out of nothing. Because the Pope said so. What do they do with Laudato Si? Ugh. Anyway, this is the standard for, uh, for, uh, for being a member of, like the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, and others. Not all of them, but if you're ELCA, well, if you're a weather-wearing uh, biker lesbian type, not only can you be a member, you can be a celebrity pastor, Pastor X, Pastor X. What is a female bishop called? Bishopette? There's no such thing in the Bible. Anyway, that this is, you know, for conservative Lutherans, this is the standard of membership. You must conform with this. This says the Bible is the only authority, by the way. They always say the Bible is the only authority, and then they pull out something else. But you have to agree with this. You can go to you know, a fundamentalist Baptist church. And they might have a statement of faith. This is what we believe on a website or something, just some basic stuff. But if you ask them, what do I have to do to be a member here? They'll probably pull out a different sheet of paper that might have things like uh, uh, no drinking, no doing this, no doing that, other standards. Could Jesus Christ be, a, be accepted as a member in those churches? Absolutely not. Yeah, we're Bible believers here, except uh, for other things that we believe the Bible teaches because we want the Bible to teach that. And if you don't agree with our interpretation or our imposition of our rules, you can't be a member here. Is that the church of Jesus Christ? Does it belong to him? No. None of these things are truly... His church. His church gathers in his name. Not in the name of Luther or uh, this book or uh, the, uh, the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith or the three, um, three standards of unity or whatever they call that. And uh, uh, certainly not the Nazarene Manual. What's the official name here? Manual. The official name is Manual. 
No, that's the real rules. That's the real standard. Not the Bible, not Christ. So what kind of Christian church is that? It's not. They're not gathering in his name. They're gathering as Nazarenes or Lutherans or Presbyterians or Roman Catholics. And the real thing, is, and the issue is they would exclude Christ from the Lord's table. The Lord, if Jesus Christ entered into a Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, he would be forbidden to take part in communion. Oh, no, our, our Catholic Church and many other churches. Oh, no, oh, no, you can't do that. You're not qualified. <laughs> Wait a minute, I am the bread. <laughs> and if he said that, what would happen? They'd, they'd, they'd walk him out the door, maybe call the cops. How is it his church? Like I said, would we notice him if he came in to one of our so-called churches? Would we realize that the Lord was there? And if he get, began to speak, what would the reaction be? Would it not? Would the deacons not march him out? Oh. Do these? The same goes for churches of Christ or Christian churches that are of that sect, sex, the Restoration Movement stuff. They have their own rules, too. They, they, they claim to be the true Christian church. Anything that claims to be the true Christian church, you know right away, they're not. And I, it, like when they do communion, I've never seen communion done in such an empty way as they do it because it's just another law. Well, we did, the Bible says to do this, so we do it. And it's, it's utterly without meaning. Every time, and they do it every service. I've been there in many of them, and it is the most vacuous thing there is. It's not done in remembrance of Christ. They don't, they have no concept of true Christianity. It's just empty. It's, it's, it's just rules. It's just rules. The, the law of Christ, they make everything into a law, typically. Now, there are, again, you're talking about semi-independent churches, like independent Baptists, semi-independent Baptists, not really independent. But if Christ wouldn't be welcomed, if he could not become a member in his own church, don't you think there's something wrong? He came to his own, and his own received him not. Where would Christ go? I don't know. Now, he was known to eat with sinners and tax collectors. And he was, you know, the Pharisees, what they, the, the holy ones. The Nazarenes came along. Or the Lutherans came along, or no, they 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 wouldn't care if you drank alcohol. Lutherans have no problem with alcohol uh, from Germany and those areas. No, no, there's <laughs> that's not an issue there. I've never heard of a prohibitionist Lutheran. No, they, they don't have that issue. But uh, in fact, they complained about prohibition, I believe. Might have laid, uh, raised some biblical objections, because it certainly is. But uh, the Bible never got in the way of moralistic Protestantism in the United States. Never, ever, ever did it. Man-made religion, self uh, will worship in King James. That's a good way to put it. We worship according to our own will, not according to the will of God. No, not in spirit and truth but what we want, like John Piper. When Christ is displaced, when he, wouldn't, when, when he couldn't be a member of the church, isn't that like a test right there? 
that, that he couldn't be a member in his own, what claims to be his church, because of all the man-made requirements. What would, he, what would happen if he said, well, you must be born again? You must be born again of the Spirit. The fact that you were, you were sprinkled with water or dunked in water does not make you a member of my church. You must be born of my Spirit. You must be born from above. Well, how do we do that? Well, you don't do that. The Spirit blows where he wills. Has he blown through you? Yeah, you know, he would. He would not be accepted. His words would not be accepted. See, if if it's, if he said it two thousand years ago, it's safe. If he was saying it in the congregation today, what would the reaction be? Think about that. <sighs> and even even some of the. Almost all the movements that sought to restore biblical Christianity have always crashed into the rocks. Um, the Restoration Movement, you know, the, the Campbellites and the Stoneites and all those people, which also extended into the Mormons. Oh, Lord. And men, the, uh, Joseph Smith stole a lot of followers and leaders from the Restoration Movement, which, which were supposed to be the Christian church. Or the Church of Christ. They were totally deceived by, by a false prophet. They weren't born again. They weren't actually followers of Christ. They it was the the Campbells came along with these with these and their some of their followers with you know this this really stripped down, watered down Christianity, uh, which was basically uh, you you follow Alexander Campbell. That was you follow his newsletters. That's what you do. He became a follower of Alexander Campbell. He wasn't Jesus Christ. And they made everything into law. They were essentially Pelagians or Socinians, some of them. Rationalists, very much rationalists. Five John Locke had a lot of influence on uh, Alexander Campbell. John Locke was a heretic, a deist. Now, Campbell's theology wasn't that bad. But it was they when they stripped everything away from the denominational Christianity, they stripped a lot of real Christianity away, too. They threw the baby out with the bathwater and ended up with nothing, including, in some cases, a denial of the Trinity. So, you know, they, their, their slogans sound good. No book but the Bible. I agree. No creed but Christ. Sounds good to me. But that's not what they practice. All these movements crash. Uh, many others, the... Uh, that that happens to be an indigenous American thing. And it crashed, you know, especially with Joseph Smith. The restored Church of Jesus Christ, or the Latter Day Church, the Latter Day Saints, you know, that's restoration. They talk about restoring the the original Christianity, and they have nothing to do with with Jesus Christ and original Christianity at all. Their Jesus has nothing to do with the Jesus of the Bible. But look at, uh, let's see, who else is good? There's so many examples you could come up with, but they're not that well known. But the house church movement, uh, a number of, oh, a decade or so, and it's also been called the simple church or whatever. There was a movement to go back to uh, New Testament Christianity. Nothing wrong with that. But it, it's, it did the same thing as a restoration movement. It started making the form into a law and the form into the substance rather than Christ himself. So rather than simply gathering in houses as Christians, you know, just who, who cares about the building? We don't need to be, you have all this claptrap around the building, uh, the mortgage and the insurance and 
the, all, the, all the utilities and hiring a pastor and all this garbage. We don't need that. You don't, It's true. There's been a number of movements through history that's, that did the same thing. The Brethren Movement in England, the, the Plymouth Brethren, at least part of them, came. We, we don't actually need this. We can gather together in simplicity as brothers and sisters in Christ and and do communion and all these and have study the Bible and all these other things. We don't need all these denominations. We don't need the Anglican Church or the Baptist Church. We don't need that stuff. The Bible doesn't say we need that stuff. True. Well, what happened? They immediately split and fractured, and the fractures that and the house church movement. The fractures are always the same. It's people that have not been born again that want to make everything into a set of rules, like the Nazarenes do. I mean, rules, 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 rules. The Bible, the New Testament, don't you know it's all about rules that we have to follow? No, it's not. No, it's not. It's Christ in you. We're saved by faith, not by law. And if you substitute law for, for Christ, you end up with death. Because the law only condemns. The law cannot give you life. The law cannot save. So if you create your own law, it can't save. Especially if God's law can't save you, how can yours? But they, they always, like the house church movement, it became always about the form and the communion, about the meal. It, it, well, it has to be a, a communal, a full communal meal. And we have to meet in a particular way. It's the form of meeting in a house that makes it the true church. It's doing communion as a full fellowship meal that makes it the true church. No! You can have church without either of those. It's gathering together because you belong to Christ as his people. And the church exists. There's a difference between the church and the church gathered. The gathering of the church. The meeting of the church. The church always exists because it's God's people, those who belong to Christ. You know, if the government showed, closed down every denomination, every uh, institution, every church building, confiscated them all, it wouldn't affect the Church of Jesus Christ at all. It would purify it. We'd find a way to gather together one way or another. And the ones that didn't belong to him wouldn't bother. It's like, why would I want to do that? You know, all the social clubs have begun. All the man-made rules have begun. Those aren't essential. It's just like the, the formal liturgical churches, confessional churches. Confessionalism is really a different thing, but liturgical churches are almost always confessional. You could strip all that stuff away. It wouldn't make any difference. Because none of it has anything to do with Christ himself. It's all imposed by man. Man's good ideas. Oh, we should do this. We should do that. What does Christ think about what we do? What does Christ think about us? Are we his? Have you truly been born again, born from above? born of the Spirit, born of the Word of God, by His will, not by yours, or not by your parents, or not by race, but simply because of God. Are you His workmanship? You should know that if you are. You might not understand it right away, but when you're born again, you know there's something different. And you know you, you actually do believe. Unlike trying to believe, you actually do believe. You actually do trust in Christ. You actually do look to him as your Savior, trusting in what he did rather than what you do, 
you look to yourself and say, "Uh uh-uh, this flesh isn't going to get me into heaven. My works aren't going to get me to heaven. I'm... When I try to do something, I fail constantly. I'm a sinner, but I don't want to sin. That's a change right there. That's an indication you've been born again. You realize that you continue, you you do sin, but it's not what you want. And you realize that Christ is your Savior, that he did something about your sinfulness even though that you are not perfect. He paid the price. You are right with God because of what Christ did for you. Not because of your works. Not because of your religion. But because of Christ. The one whom the Father sent into the world to save you. You have a relationship with God that was created by God. Not by you, not by men, not by a church. God created a relationship between you and him in Christ. You have been united to God in Christ. You belong to him. You are a child of God. And the Holy Spirit will bear witness of that. Not in a dramatic way, probably, but you'll just sort of know and understand that. sooner or later. Sometimes we, we just, you know, we, we, we're we born again and we're new creatures in Christ, but we're babes. And we don't see things, we, think, we don't see things with clarity. You have to grow up into faith often. And as you grow older, you should see things more clearly. Understand that. Looking back at your own experiences, you say, oh, now, nah, yeah. I can see what God was doing then. I might not understand what he's doing today, but I could look look back and say, yeah, that was the Father. That was the Lord working in me. We see dimly in this flesh. But we have a relationship with God that's not mediated by the church or by anything else except Jesus Christ, who is God, the God-man. He is the one mediator. No institution can mediate between God and man. Only Christ. He is salvation. He himself is God's grace. He himself is God. And we can know him. See, when I was growing up, I didn't know God. I knew that God existed. And I was told about God, sort of, once in a while, dimly. When the pastor wasn't preaching a message out of some paperback novel. But I didn't come to know God in any of those institutions. I came to know God in an Air Force dormitory in uh, Minot, North Dakota, kneeling next to a bunk. No one in the room but me until the Holy Spirit came in. God took pity on this poor sinner and revealed that Christ had died for my sins, all of them, past, present, and future. And because of Christ... And what he did, I was right with God. Christ is my salvation. And from that day on, I knew God. I knew something was different. I could not have told you in biblical language what had happened. But something happened. Didn't make me perfect, oh no but put me in relationship with the perfect God and a perfect Savior. That's what everyone needs, Christ. And when the focus is off of him, off of Christ and Christ crucified, when that when that's pushed into the background someplace, something is seriously wrong. 
if it's in your life, it's time for you to repent. If it's in a church, a so-called church, and that's the normal thing, well, it's not the church of the Lord Jesus Christ because people aren't gathered together in his name to give thanks and worship to him. They're there for some other reason. Good test. Could the Lord be a member of your church? 